this is me. This was my first time to Doheny. I was coming here to interview, and I'm pictured here with uh, three of my fellow former Co-Wilmer residents, and little did I know that this was going to be the beginning of such a wonderful professional relationship. And I want to acknowledge the role that the late Bernice Brown played, because she is the one who approved the fellowship for Doheny at the time. And I also have to acknowledge the contribution of my preceptor, Don Liu, who took me as his first fellow, and my chairman who approved the entire process. So I can't give this talk without acknowledging their role in my being here in front of you today. We're going to talk about missed diagnoses. And we can't seem to move the needle very much with misdiagnoses. And when you analyze these events, it's commonly a confluence of factors that go into us missing the diagnosis. And when you look at those factors, it's not exclusive to ophthalmologists. It's not exclusive even to medicine. We find the same factors leading to errors in other arenas. And one of those is the arena of aviation. I've had an interest in aviation since pretty much I was born. I was on a tarmac before I was walking. This is me with my father, and he likes to say this picture depicts his two great loves in life until the person who took this picture, my mom, <clears throat> clears her throat and says, you don't have a third love? And he says, oh yeah, right, two of my three loves in life, my daughter and airplanes. The first time I saw this picture, though, I thought he was trying to impale me with it, and I didn't think <laughs> that it showed a lot of love. So it wasn't long when I was a little girl that I realized all I wanted to do in life is to be a military pilot. I was born at Edwards, just above the ridge here. My dad was a test pilot in the Air Force, and I wanted to be just like him. I wanted to go into the military. I wanted to be a pilot. In this very 70s picture, however, you can see that I became myopic by the time I was about seven. And at the time, you could not have a military career as an aviator if you weren't uncorrected 2020. So that dashed my hopes for an aviation career. However, I have continued to indulge my love of aeronautics because my father went on to be a pilot for Northwest Airlines. And we continue to this day to talk about planes and we commonly talk about airline crashes. And I'm going to go over one airline crash that I think has a lot of similarities to the mistakes that we make in our practices. So this is an Air France Airbus 380, and it was just like the one that took off almost exactly seven years ago from Rio de Janeiro bound nonstop for Paris. Now, this is a long flight, longer than the crew can man the controls, so they always fly with two crews. Air France chose or chooses to have, instead of two separate crews, they have three pilots and each one is allowed to take a break. There's only one captain, and the other two are certified co-pilots, but one of those co-pilots is deputized, if you will, to be a super co-pilot and is allowed by FAA regulations to occupy the left seat when the captain takes a break. So about two hours into flight, as they were leaving Brazilian airspace, the captain took his scheduled flight break, leaving the deputized co-pilot in the left seat. And they were entering some thunderstorms at 35,000 feet. And about the time they were entering the thunderstorms, the autopilot kicked off. And it kicked off because the airspeed indicator stopped functioning correctly. And on every plane are small little veins that point forward, and they measure the airspeed. And these pitot tubes, as they're called after the French person who designed them, measure airspeed. And they had iced over in the thunderstorm and had malfunctioned. So when you don't have an airspeed indicator, the autopilot says, I don't have the information I need to adequately control the plane, so I'm going to kick off. So that leaves the pilots to fly the plane. So what happened next is still inexplicable, but the co-pilot pulled up on the nose, climbing from 35,000 feet to 38,000 feet. Now, how do planes stay aloft? If you remember your fluid dynamics from physics, when you have laminar flow, whether it's water or whether it's air, and you introduce a foil, the laminar flow splits apart and meets again at the end of the foil. That going over the top has a longer direction to go, and therefore it's faster. When that laminar flow is faster, it creates less pressure. So you have less pressure on top, 
more pressure on the bottom, that equals lift. And that's how wings keep an airplane in the air. So you need a certain amount of airspeed. But you also need that foil to be at the correct angle. And as you rotate that angle of the foil up, that laminar flow starts to break down. You get turbulence and you no longer have that smooth laminar flow and all of Bernoulli's principle essentially breaks down and you lose your lift even if you have the airspeed if you're at too high of an angle, which is what happens when you pull up on the nose. So it's like airline flying 101. If you get into a stall, you point the nose down, you regain airspeed, and then you maintain your lift. And it's almost as instinctual as putting your hands out if you're to trip. It's still not clear why the pilot did that, but this is essentially all you need to do if you get into a stall, point the nose down, get your airspeed up, get your lift back, and then you pull out into level flight. So you might be asking, okay, well, we don't know why the left seat pilot flying the airplane was pulling back, but doesn't the other guy understand what's going on, and doesn't he correct them? Well, in order to understand why that didn't happen, you have to understand a little bit about the flight deck. A Boeing flight deck has two controls, one for each pilot. They're called yokes, and they basically are sitting between the pilot's legs. And when you turn one to the left, the other one turns to the left also because they're yoked. When you pull back on one, the other one pulls back. So the pilot not flying, or PNF, always understands how the plane is being controlled because he or she can feel and see how the controls are moving. Airbus, however, does not have that yoke system. They fly by a stick on either side to the left of the uh, captain's seat and to the right on the co-pilot seat. And they're not yoked, they're independent. You can flip a switch to take control. And as soon as the autopilot clicked off, as is customary, the senior pilot says, I've got controls. And they did hear that on the, record, on the flight recorder. But again, when he's pulling back on the stick, the guy in the right seat is not aware of what he's doing. Now, it's a, it's a little bit of a chaotic situation in the cockpit at this point. And they pieced together from flight data recordings that at this point, the plane was yawing left to right and being buffeted. And it was clear to the passengers, as well as the captain who'd taken his break, that something was amiss. So he bursts back into the cockpit. Now, they are in a stall. And what's interesting is there are stall warnings in every commercial cockpit. However, there was such an angle of bank that the information being fed to the computer was so erroneous that it wasn't functioning. When the pilot put the nose down even just a little bit, then the stall warning started coming on again because it could pick up that information. But it spooked the pilot, and he thought he was doing something wrong, and he would pull the nose back up. So that was one of the things that was going on. And so it was a chaotic scene in the cockpit, but the, the captain comes up, and he's able, without too much effort, to figure out what's going on. But this is essentially the angle that the plane was falling to the ocean with its nose up. And the flight deck recorders show them trying to troubleshoot trying to figure out what's going on, and the captain does finally figure it out. But at this point, and what they weren't paying attention to is the altimeter, which was correctly, everything else in the plane was functioning correctly except the airspeed indicator. They could have pieced together the other information from the, that, the data that they did have, but nobody was paying attention to the altimeter, which was showing them dropping it at almost 10,000 feet a minute. So in four minutes, from level flight at 35,000 feet, all 228 people aboard were killed. So within about a day or two, they found the first wreckage, and they were able to recover about 41 of the 228 bodies. And that, along with the flight deck recorder, which wasn't found for two years, they were able to figure out exactly what happened, and based on the types of injuries, there were spinal injuries and lower leg fractures, and they pieced together that this was likely the way the plane hit the ground, or hit the water. So what commonly happens, is, as, as my dad and I have talked about over the years, is when things happen in the cockpit, people get distracted and they forget the very basics of flying the airplane. And we could compare this to what happens with us in our offices where we basically forget to treat the patient. There's a lot of parallels there. And delayed or misdiagnoses are common. They're responsible for hundreds of thousands of deaths in outpatient and inpatient settings per year. And at OMIC, they were 14% of all claims alleged 
misdiagnoses, and they're very expensive as well. Billions of dollars have been paid out worldwide in claims like this and at OMIC, about a third of all the money we've ever paid out in indemnity is related to cases that involved misdiagnoses. When you look at the top 10 indemnity payments that have been made in our, con in our company's 28-year history, eight of the 10 have something to do with missed diagnoses. And here, look at the top. What are the factors? If you look at these cases, if we do our accident investigation on misdiagnosis claims, what factors are at play? Is the system at fault? Sometimes, when you look at the totals at the bottom, 11 out of the 71 total, but there are never any instances where the patient is a factor in misdiagnoses. Almost always, the take-home message from the slide is it has something to do with the way physicians think. So let's go back to that flight. So what were the factors in that flight's coming down? Weather played a small role. Equipment malfunction, the pitot tube, again, losing your airspeed started the cascade of events that led to the crash, but certainly could have been surmounted in retrospect. Hindsight's always 2020. Systems issues, one pilot not exactly understanding what the other pilot was doing. Lack of communication, again, when you're in a situation like that, somebody's supposed to be watching the altimeter and calling out the level of altimeter at all times. That's, that's, that's basic 101. And what it also comes down to is pilot error. We still don't know why in that situation the pilot pulled up on the nose and, and kept that plane in the stall. So when we look at all of us in our practices, for most of us, weather is not an issue when we're missing our diagnoses. But certainly there are some cases where equipment does malfunction. We've had a couple cases at OMIC, one where the head rest on a bed during a cataract procedure dropped at an inopportune moment, leading to damage to the eye during surgery, and a laser which misfired. The settings were correct, but the amount of energy that was delivered was not calibrated properly. But in general, those are not as common as systems issues or communication issues. One referring doctor referring in, worried about the patient's brain tumor, the accepting doctor seeing the strabismus and thinking that was the reason why the, the patient was being referred and does strabismus surgery but misses the brain tumor. And again, physician error. So what is it about the way we think? Are we missing the exotic diseases? No, we're not. These are the top four diagnoses that we tend to miss. And if you talk to any resident who's been on that job for a week, they'll be able to make these diagnoses. And we should make them too, but we get distracted in our practices and we get very busy in our practices and we fail to give our own time out. And it's, it's kind of like when you're going to work, that's a routine trip for you, it's a familiar trip for you, it's, if you have, if you've heard of this book called Think Fast, Think Slow, there's a part of our brains that makes fast decisions all the time. Going to work, we, we remember where all the stoplights are, but if you introduce a new stop sign, even though it's big and it's red, we sometimes fail to see it, which is why they put flags and things like that on new stop signs. And it's also the tenant of the marketing campaign behind Buick, where they always show by somebody saying, I'm in the Buick, come find me. Like, I don't see a Buick, I don't see a Buick. And it's right there because apparently they're looking for old, some old stodgy car and not some hip Buick. So we don't tend to see what we don't look for. And as physicians, we don't ask the questions. If a patient's not responding to our treatment, if someone is deteriorating when they should be improving, that's the time when we have to stop our fast thinking and start our slow thinking and start asking the questions. Redo the H&P, go over the history, go back over your physical exam. We had a case once where a post-LASIK patient was being treated for weeks for what was called SANS of Sahara, and every chart note shows SANS of Sahara, SANS of Sahara as the diagnosis, and they were treated with steroids for about six months and the vision deteriorated. Anybody here know why? And you didn't even see the patient. And here was the doctor seeing the patient every day, never checked the IOP in those six months on steroids. So again, back to our aviation versus medicine. They're both highly regulated industries where the cost of failure is great. Checklists, in fact, we, we borrowed checklists and timeouts from the world of aviation within medicine. And, but I think one area where we fall down is accident investigation. FAA, NTSB, all over any airline crash. We don't have the same types of mechanisms and systems in place to critically analyze why we fail to make the diagnosis sometimes. And I think that's a reason why in 2015 there wasn't a single death worldwide in any of the nine almost 
9 million passengers who were transported last year, not a single death due to pilot error, equipment malfunction, or weather-related issues. But we're still killing the equivalent of almost two to three Air France crashes people per week with misdiagnoses. So again, when your patient's not doing what they're supposed to be doing, or when the patient is not responding like you think they should be responding, just take one step back in your very, very busy clinic day and review everything that you need to review. Start from the beginning. Put a new set of eyes on it. Give yourself your own second opinion because almost always the clues are there, the signs are there. You just have to make that connection. I'm sorry. Can we go back two slides? Great. So the good news is, usually we have more than four minutes to make the correct diagnoses on our patients. And our take-home messages that I want to leave you with are that misdiagnoses create a lot of morbidity and mortality, and as a result, the damages to our patients and to the medical arena and society are great. There are many factors that are often involved, but the primary factor is the way we physicians think. And so again, take your own time out, look at the information that is available to you, and connect the dots, and I think we'll make great inroads into the problem of misdiagnoses. Thank you.